Welcome to Instruction Discussion, our weekly look at the latest topics and trends in education affecting schools here on Long Island and schools around the world. Whether you're a teacher, parent, or student, listen for tips and strategies to help you navigate the educational landscape. There's a bell. It's time to start today's instruction discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello, I'm Kevin Boston Hill, and welcome to Instruction Discussion, where each week we will examine a recent trend or development in education and its impact on Long Island. This pandemic has opened our eyes to a lot of things that need to be done differently when it comes to education. We often focus a great deal on the academic and physical development of children, with parents and school districts debating how they can reopen schools and resume athletic programs. The one development that seems to get overlooked is the mental development of children and the trauma that they face, whether because of the fact their social and academic needs are not being met or because they are faced with moments of grief that they do not know how to deal with. Today, we welcome therapist, Dr. Victoria Grinman, who specializes in trauma-informed practices and working with parents of children with autism. She is also the founder of Growing Kind Minds, LLC, a global community platform that allows her to share her expertise and resources with students, parents, and other caregivers from around the world. Let's welcome the parent whisperer, Dr. Victoria Grinman to an instruction discussion on 90.3 WHPC. Oh my goodness, Kevin, can you do all my introductions? That was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am I am available. I am available for parties and everything else that you may need. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. I can't wait to just provide value. <laughs> well, before we actually do get into today's class discussion. Let's find out a little bit more about you, especially we know that we're in the midst of um, Women's History Month and so forth. So it's great to have a a, a very prominent uh, female doctor here with us today. So where did you get your start? How did you fall into this particular career? Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Is my dad going to be listening? No. um, Well, listen, I think that um, aside from just, hey, you know, I went to school, I you know, really fell in love with psychology and then really, really fell in love with social work. Um, I think that the, what, what I'll go back to is when I was a kid, um, I had a great childhood. My family and I were refugee immigrants. Um, we, we had a challenging, amazing, incredible growing experience as I was a kid. And I did have moments in my interactions with family members, with parents, where I often thought, what the heck is going on here? You know, like, why is my dad acting that way? Why is mom acting? You know, and and I would always be so curious and wonder and I would react. And, you know, so growing up, I always wanted to fix what was going on and understand why people did what they did and why I was feeling how I was feeling. And fast forward, Kevin, you know, I was in school and I was interested in helping people and I didn't really know who I wanted to work with. And I fell into the field of working with children. So I've been working with children by at this point when I, you know, for over 10 years, now it's over 15. And I realized that in supporting parents, I'm really supporting the child. And if we support the parent and really heal whatever it is that's there, um, we can actually change the trajectory of how family dynamics work inside of our homes. You know, we talk a lot about intergenerational trauma and the passing down of dynamics that are just not workable. If we, yes, helping children is really important, and I think that's great, but if we help the parent understand themselves and have a loving relationship with themselves and heal whatever parts were there that were not healed prior to them having children, um, we can help them really create change and empower them in the relationships with their kids. So in my parent coaching, it is with children with autism as well, but really it's broad. Um, my passion is to really support families in this way. And I you, I am the parent whisperer. I have like a sixth sense about it. It's It's a gift and I keep giving it. Great. You know, I was actually going to ask you how you got dubbed the parent whisperer um, and and everything. So so I'll I'll ask you, how how, where did that come from? Where did that originate? Yeah. So, you know, I 
transparent. I, I was married. I am divorced. Never had a child, let alone a child with special needs. So people would say, well, how, you know, how, how do you know? Right. I just, you know, my mom is a neurologist and everybody, she has a sixth sense when it comes to working with people and diagnosis and assessment. And I think Kevin, because of my keen awareness as a kid and my intuition and just who I am DNA wise, including all of the work that I've done, you know, academically, just I have an awareness and a sense of how to assess what's going on for a person like that, you know, and when you do a good assessment, not just a good, but when you do an excellent assessment, the treatment that follows is is in line. And I got dubbed the parent whisper because time and time and time again, I would just meet with families and they would have calls with me just to, you know, help support them. Somebody told them about me and I would have two or three, you know, minute conversations and I would say something and say, how did you know that? How did you, you just gave me more clarity in five minutes than I've had. Like, I feel somebody told me the other day, you make me feel 10 pounds lighter every time I talk to you. Mm. And so somebody dubbed me the parent whisperer and um, it just kind of stuck. You you mentioned earlier uh, about the, the need to support, well, by supporting parents, you're actually helping children and I think that's also I, it resonates with me because as a as a school administrator, that's the kind of my approach. I figure, well, if I if I support the teachers in what they need, it'll trickle down. It'll in turn support the students and give them what they need. So I see the the parallels there that, as far as what you're talking about. So what are some of the signs that parents or caregivers can can kind of look out for, whether in themselves that they need to deal with or even signs in their children as far as that they may be experiencing some kind of anxiety? That's a really great question. And I want to say something about anxiety. Anxiety as a diagnosis is one thing, but we as people, just to normalize it a little bit, as a feeling, as an emotion, anxiety is pervasive, right? Mm. So so it's just a human feeling and emotion that we are having right now as a collective. And you're right, helping the teacher, helping the parent, because um, when we see, and, and to answer your question, when we see a behavior in a child that we don't like, or it's not what we would prefer, I always say that the behavior communicates something to us. And so it's not just something that's like annoying and we need to eradicate it or course correct it and reinforce a different behavior. The child is showing us something that's going on for them as a response to the environment. And so we are the environment. Children, you know, we are the environment. We're the only people in their life, really. You know what I mean? Like until they get older and they start to expand their circle. So I always say, if there's a behavior out there that we don't like, let's look over here to see what's going on for me about this behavior. An example would be, I have parents that come to me all the time with these very, very specific annoyances about their children or a teacher. Because I used to be in I, you know, I was in the school system for over 10 years, for 12 years. So, you know, I I work with teachers a lot, hands on. And I always say, okay, so this behavior is annoying or this behavior, you know, what's going on for you about it? And we find out so many things like um, if the child is not washing their hands or flushing the toilet, right? Um, And the parent is just like bananas about it. Um, There is something there for that parent around hygiene and order. And it goes deep. I mean, for some of these parents, it's like they had a parent who was a hoarder who, you know, the, the, the community didn't enjoy or like and they tried to hide, you know, you know, something about their parent or there was a mental illness that was being hidden. I mean, these are real examples. And so once we start to sort of talk about it, right, like and understand that it was so important for this parent to have order and to look perfect to look like everything was okay on the outside that now they have a child and they put all this pressure around order and now all this pressure around order became this manifested behavior that they can't stand 
how do you get parents or anyone else, the adults in this child's life to open up like that, to, act, to go deep, to peel back all the, the layers of the onion, so to speak, so that they can get down to that, that deep rooted, that deep seated feeling that caused the, this outward behavior that they're experiencing now? Another great question, Kevin. It's different for different parents. Some parents come ready and they're like, I want to do the work. And I'm like, yes, hallelujah. You're my perfect, right? I just, I want to do that work. I'm there. But we have to be realistic that most of the time people are coming and they have a view. Like they don't know what they don't know. They don't know that they are the access point to this change. They don't know that they can actually be empowered. So how do I do it? I really hold space for people to share with me wherever they're at. And I know it sounds so simple, but I I, I say it like a broken record. I just start with where they're at and allow them to speak. Like I had a parent, I'll I'll tell you, I was, somebody was referred to, they always refer the harder ones to me. (laughs) I had a parent, she was so angry. She's like, I've been through, because she has a childhood, I've been through everything. I I don't know what you're going to tell me, but the reason I'm coming to you is because, you know, my daughter's therapist, you know, recommended you and she said that you could help. But I'm telling you, like, she has autism, so I've had all the coaching in the world. There's nothing you're going to be able and angry. I mean, really mm-hmm. in pain, in so much pain. And we had our back and forth, back and forth. We had our third session the other day, this week. And she started off, big smile on her face, and she said, I just want to say thank you. Last week, you just let me talk. I share things with you that I haven't shared with anyone in years. And that is how you start. You know, you build a relationship based on genuine, authentic, benevolent curiosity and trust in another human being. It's not about just doing a service. It's like when you enter into a relationship with someone where you, it's like a switch goes off for me and I'm just like in total service to this person. And when you are genuinely, people feel that, you know. I like the approach that you take because most people would think that, okay, if if I have a child with autism and and I want to learn how to work with that child, that if I go to any type of therapist, I come to you as a therapist, that you're going to give me strategies on how to work with my child. And I think that's kind of the the expected approach. And that's probably why this particular parent was was really upset because, look, I've tried everything. I've, I've heard all the different strategies. I've heard all the approaches and nothing seems to be working. Well, OK, let's take a step back now, because I think your approach is different in that. Well, you tried those things, the strategies. Well, what have you been doing for yourself? And has any have you listened to yourself? Has anyone listened to what your needs are? Because there's a clear cry for help there. And and I think that's where the the parent whisperer in you comes out because you were able to recognize that. And I think that if we're able to really find out what the or listen to that cry um, it, it is a it just quickly reminded me of a poem that was written years ago called Please Hear What I'm Not Saying. Mm-hmm. And so if you're able to get through all of the 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 animosity and the yelling and screaming and find okay well what's causing that in you and let's deal with that then it'll be easier to work with whatever children with disabilities that you may have but you have to work with your own problems first so i think that i think that approach you you take is is a novel one because most people are thinking well let's just give you strategies so that you can Mm -hmm. work with your child, not let's give you strategies on how to work with yourself first. Yeah, I I love that. I most and what you just said is right on point, because most of the time when parents come to me, they're like, I know it all. And And I say, I know, but knowing doesn't do anything for you. So it's like you're resourced. You have all the books. You've spoken to all the coaches. You've watched all the workshops. You've taken all the credits. And how resourceful are you with it? So I've had, you know, dads, like a dad said to me, like, I know that I'm supposed to do A, but every single time the situation arises and I have the opportunity to do A, I end up doing B. Why? Victoria, I know, like, I'm a smart, I'm a professor, I'm a lawyer, I'm smart, like, I know, I'm resourced. Why? And it's like, yeah, because there's like, I call them cobwebs in our mind. There are these blind spots 
cobwebs that just like create blind spots. And we don't know what, like what's keeping us from actually using and being resourceful with the resources that we actually have. And then that's where the real work starts. I make difficult things sound easy. And so it's palatable. So once I'm able to access that for someone, it empowers them to say, okay, like maybe there's something to this looking over here thing. I'm going to steal that line, cobwebs in our mind. I, I, I love that analogy that, uh, that you just came up with. Because you're right, we do create these, these blind spots that prevent us from doing what we know is correct, the, the correct behavior to do. So we, we, again, we, we're, we're learned, we're educated, and we know what we're supposed to do, but yet we still don't. And, and I think it's because of those blind spots that are created. Yeah. Do you want to go over one of yours, Kevin? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Can you imagine if we did that on air? <laughs> Maybe that, one. That, we, we, we would need more than half an hour, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are listening to Instruction Discussion on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3 WHPC. My name is Kevin Boston Hill, and our guest today is the parent whisperer and founder of Growing Minds LLC, Dr. Gr- Dr. Victoria Grinman. So, you know, let's talk a little bit about Growing Minds and what did what was the the, the motivation behind the development of that particular practice? Sure. So it's Growing Kind Minds, and um, the. The way that even the name of that came about years ago was I was working a lot with children and um, I recognized and I kept saying to the people that I was mentoring and working with that we are, and parents, that we are planting seeds, we are planting seeds, we are planting seeds. And we don't know when it's going to sprout and we don't know what it's going to look like but we're just planting seeds. And the kindness aspect of that came about because um, I was working a great deal with children with various special needs. I feel like all kids have special needs, but just for the sake of being politically correct, right? Um, All kinds of special needs. And the number one thing that people always kept saying was, I just want my child to be considerate. I just want my child to be kind. And I knew that kindness and consideration There was more to it than just strategy and teaching social skills. It was really about connecting with children, um, helping them have relationships with us, which takes much longer than just giving a strategy. And it's really about growing those things. It's not about, it's about nurturing them. It's about feeding them, watering it. It's not just about, you know, planting a seed, walking away and thinking that it's going to grow on its own. So that's where Growing Kind Minds came about. And what I do within this platform is not only provide resources one-on-one to families or individuals, because I also work with, with, with adults, I work with couples, I do a lot of marriage work, um, and a lot of work with families who are blended families, all sorts of different things. Um, but it's also a, a resource nationally. So I travel both internationally and nationally, now with the pandemic less so, and it's more on Zoom, um, training and also talking about post-traumatic growth. And it was really my area of research and my doctoral work and continues to be. So it's about trauma, how to support children and teens and individuals with their body, so body-based interventions, and also how to help facilitate post-traumatic growth um, in, in people who've, who've suffered. So I do want to I do want to make sure I I got that name correctly. It is Growing Kind Minds LLC, and the website is www.growingkindminds.com. So that if anybody wants to find out a little bit more about that or even to enlist your services, they can go to that website to find out more. That's right. So you talked about in dealing with uh, trauma informed or students and, and people that the way to kind of work them through it is working through their bodies. So talk to us a little bit about how you use yoga and other mindfulness activities to support people through uh, those through trauma as well as through other uh, disabilities like autism or, or other things like that. We have a very short amount of time, and this is a huge topic. But what I'll say is that um, trauma or challenges are um, things that get integrated 
into our psyche, but also into our bodies. And so think about somebody who has, for example, like a skateboarding accident and they, you know, break bones and they weren't able to stop themselves with their with their hand, right? So once I was working with a teen who he, you know, every time he was triggered um, by his experience of, you know, the skateboarding accident, he would just kind of, you know, stop every single time he, he there was a, there was something with his hand that he wasn't able to complete in order mm. to stop the fall. And so the trauma gets integrated and it integrates into our body. So our body, it's like Bessel van der Kolk's book is incredible. The body keeps the score. And he talks a great deal about how our body remembers. And if you think about even children who have had terrible abuses happen to them before their ability to verbalize, that trauma actually gets integrated into their body. And it's not a cognitive thing. It's something that their body remembers. And so yoga mindfulness, body-based approaches like sensory motor psychotherapy, and there are so many others out there, they don't just speak to the part of the brain that's cognitive in nature, that's verbal, that's able to think and rationalize. They actually touch on the parts of us that are not verbal, that are actually, you know, deeply integrated into our central nervous system. And so yoga and movement and and mindfulness, um, we utilize it to have give the person that we're working with opportunity to befriend their body again, to really get to know and be inside of their body again, to feel their bodies um, and to understand themselves in a, in a, in a way that gives them access to actually change the things that they want to change. Because the thing about trauma, Kevin, is that it gives us this feeling like we can't control our emotions or, or what our body does. You know, I have so many people I work with that say, I can't, I, I can't be intimate with my partner. Like I want to be, but I like can't, like my body just won't let me and I hate my body for it. And let's say they've been through sexual abuse in the past. And so, you know, we work on understanding that your body needed to do those things to push away because, you know, the memory is away because that was so traumatic. But now, you know, that pushing away is no longer working for you because you want that proximity, that love. And so how can we, you know, befriend our body again? And so we utilize these approaches. They're very specific. Um, you know, they're intricate, but anybody can do it. Just starting with breath, for example. I was going to ask you if they were, if those techniques were difficult to learn. And would you recommend that people go to a, I guess, a, a a mindfulness expert to learn these techniques? Or is there something that maybe a, a parent can kind of pick up and teach their child at home that would be able to at least support their child through whatever trauma that they may be going through? Sure. Um, I'll always say as a caveat that if a child or any individual has been through a significant trauma and there are symptoms of that and you'll see that in behaviors um, and there are different behaviors, of course, try to enlist the support of a professional um, to assess at least what the child or individual needs. But also to give a really, really quick tip for parents and families out there, you can simply just start with breath work. And there are so many different resources I can say, you know, reach out to me. I'll send you some of my favorites. But just starting to recognize your breath. And what I mean by that is our breath is our anchor and it's the best tool that we have. And it is one of the most underutilized ones. And I always say just for the point of, you know, creating a pierced listening that our breath is the only thing that separates us from the dead. I mean, it is that powerful. And so if we can teach our children and ourselves to say, oh, my God, like, you know, even during dinner, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, you know what? Your orange juice spilled and mommy reacted. And you know what? I reacted and not, it wasn't that big a deal. You know what? I need a minute. I need a minute. Let me just take a deep breath in through my nose and out through my mouth. And again, in through my nose and just model, right, that in through the nose because it it actually triggers your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of the autonomic nervous system that is really relaxing, right? And modeling, just taking a moment to create space using breath between what's happened and a reaction. 
can really give a child this opportunity to say, oh, like, I don't have to react. I can actually create a space between something upsetting that's happened and how I will choose to respond. And so anyone can do this at any point in time. You do not need to have a therapist to do it. You can start right now. Tell us a little bit about the work that you've done with um, the experience camps and how people can get involved with that. Oh, experience camps. My love. I love experience camps. So I'm going to be a clinician. I think this will be now the sixth year, a, a clinician volunteer for experience camps. I do not, you know, work for them on staff. I'm, I'm a volunteer and it's a camp for children who have lost a loved one. It's a beautiful, free, 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 free one week experience for children who have lost a significant person in their life. Um, we've got kids who have lost parents. Um, we've got, you know, twins in the same bunk. We've got, so it's girls and boys, and there are several locations all over the country. And so this was, um, I actually have an interview with the founder, um, uh, Sarah Darren's um, on my show called um, That Moment Heart to Heart Talk with Dr. Victoria. And she explains a lot about how she started experience camps. But it's something that, um, Kevin, is so special because it's a community of people that get together and we all get it. Like we get, we just get it. We get one another and it's fun. It's like, it's, it's teaching kids that they can go through grief. They have their own individual grief journey and they can emote and express at their own pace. And we have obviously structured activities around that and then go play dodgeball five minutes later and like, you know, kick the crap out of a kickball. Do you know what I mean? Like you can have both. You don't have to be just sad or just happy, but that it really creates this opportunity for children to experience their grief journey with others along the way. And so you can find out about it. I believe it's experiencecamps.org, or if you just Google it, it's experience camps. Um, You can sign up. Um, You just fill out an application. If you have a child that would benefit. And if you are someone who is heart centered and you have this kind of work on your mind, you can become a volunteer. We're always looking for incredible volunteers to be counselors and clinicians. And that's it. It's, it's probably Kevin, one of the best things I do every year. I think that there will probably be a a growing need for something like that, especially in this time, because you probably have had children who have lost loved ones due to the pandemic. And and so they would need to have an outlet, a resource where they can uh, turn to other people and see that they're not going through this journey alone. That because the 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 stages of grief are are potent. They're real. And adults have difficult time going through those stages. I think of the seven stages of grief. So imagine from a child's perspective what they're going through and what they what they would have to deal with. So I think having that type of communal experience would definitely be a uh, beneficial to our students. And I think the, and the price is right. <laughs> you can't beat that free. So mm-hmm. I think definitely uh, parents should be able to go on to, can they go onto your website and, and maybe there's a link there that they can find out more information or is it just going to uh, experiencecamps.org? So they would have to go to experiencecamps.org. I have some resources for experience camps on my website under resources, or they could just reach out to me and I'll connect you with a director. We'd like to thank our guest, the parent whisperer and founder of Growing Kind Minds, LLC, Dr. Victoria Grinman, for coming on our show today. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Once again, my name is Kevin Boston Hill, and thank you all for listening to Instruction Discussion right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.